Welcome back. We're now doing blog interviews with industry experts, and I'm happy to have with me Lori Harbor of Harbor Results. Lori and Team One and Harbor Results have been working closely together, and Lori in particular has expertise in plastics, manufacturing, and today we want to talk to her about her expertise in the automotive industry, which is a big marketplace for Team One Plastics. So welcome, Lori. Thank you, Craig. It's a pleasure to be here. So looking at the automotive industry, and most people would say we're crazy in being it, and then uh, we're sort of crazy in terms of we think that's the place to be. So can you sort of give us an update on the status of the industry as you see it, where we're sitting today? Well, there's a lot going on still in, within the industry after you know the bankruptcies of two of our major Tier 1 suppliers. But I think in general, the industry is definitely on an uptick. I mean, we're certainly seeing volumes return, not to the 18 million mark, which probably we may never hit again, um, but, but ultimately returning to some level of maybe 15 to 16 million units if we go out to 2015 and 2016. We're not necessarily seeing this sort of hockey stick growth back to huge volumes that we saw very quickly. Uh, it's more of a steady pace. There's a little bit of pent-up demand out there in the industry that is, is starting to get people to return to buying vehicles. But I think, generally speaking, as the economy begins to um, improve a bit, people are starting to have a little bit more confidence in, in looking out and, and buying some of these vehicles. And probably the most interesting thing from my perspective is with the series of things that have happened, which is maybe a bit of a perfect storm for some of the Japanese companies, we're seeing kind of a return to um, some U.S. production and volumes within our traditional domestic companies improve. So a little bit of kind of, you know, the return of the U.S. market. And really that's driven by a lot of the natural disasters we've seen in Japan with the earthquake and the tsunami and how it really affected a really almost at a tier two and tier three level. Isn't that what sort of was a lesson learned from that? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it, that affected the Japanese tremendously in terms of overall volume in the U.S. and around the world. Um, the biggest risk point for them was how do smaller to mid-sized companies like Team One that support them continue to, you know, how where are they positioned around the world and, and how were they affected and how does the, the broader supply chain affect the overall production vehicles. So it had a ripple effect throughout the entire automotive industry. So do you see, as you mentioned, more being consolidated within local markets then probably, right? And are they trying to do that or are they going to try to diversify in terms of not having a single source? Or is it a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. I think we're starting to see a little bit more double tooling going on where appropriate, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. if it's a larger component or something that um, they can't retool easily. We might see some of that. Um, but there's a little, lot more localization going on. We're seeing some tooling being built and moved back over here um, for production. So, uh, and, you know, it's never going to be unavoidable completely. We're not going to add a bunch of added costs to the supply chain to manage the sort of if come that a natural disaster would occur. Right, right. But there'll be some of just a better balance of the supply chain. And that's good news for the U.S. market because so much had been going overseas, um, especially over the last five or ten years. That's right. I mean, we'll see a lot more production stay here. Um, uh, as we've talked in the past, as we continue to see the economy changing in China and labor rates changing in China and other areas, I think you'll see a little bit of a move back to um, the southern states as well as Mexico in addition to the U.S. market because to some degree Mexico will become the new low-cost country. As we look back at the recession, obviously we had Chrysler and GM go through really bankrupt situations. And obviously that's been a positive that allowed the industry to continue to move on, or it could have been really a disaster uh, that would be still maybe being mm -hmm. felt. How do you see those two companies and now that they've gotten past at least the bankruptcy mm -hmm. part? Well, it's very interesting because they've kind of both taken a little bit different paths, of course. Chrysler merges or is purchased by Fiat, um, and Fiat has definitely invested a tremendous amount of money into the Chrysler operations. They're renewing almost every product over the course of the next two to three years, which again, great for suppliers, it means there's lots of new parts coming out in the marketplace. Um, they've restructured, they have actually very much so moved the Italian management into Auburn Hills, uh, Michigan, where they're, they're running Chrysler. So, um, 
no confusion about it being kind of a takeover of fiat versus a merger <laughs> of equals. Um, and at General Motors, a lot of significant change among the management team. I would say probably in the beginning, we probably thought Chrysler wasn't necessarily going to come out of this the same way. I have a little bit more hope on them right now. General Motors, frankly, I think is still struggling a bit. They've got some management issues and changes going on. That said, they have great products coming out. They have great new market share that's that's being captured, and I think they'll do well. Both of them will come through. And Ford can't be excluded from this. Yeah. They didn't take government money, yeah. but they were in this financial difficulty as everybody else was, um, but have really rejuvenated their business through new product. It was about product and winning customers back, and frankly probably won a little bit of customer sentiment because they didn't take government money. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good point because would you say Ford's probably the strongest of the big three. Yeah, I think in different areas, but yes, they're probably of the three the strongest from a, what, what's probably the most important is from a management team perspective. Mm -hmm. They've got a solid management team in place that's making decisions and is doing, is really executing. There's no frozen decision making, they're executing and moving forward. We're seeing a little bit of that freeze at GM right. as, as people are moving around. And that's always been one of the traditional problems of the big three, right, is they have these right. just huge bureaucracies that That's is right. difficult to be nimble in such a nimble market. That's right. Um, as you talked about, there's really the automotive sector is a real positive in our overall economic climate. It seems like all the other industries are struggling. <laughs> you hear about double dip. What's your feeling in terms of where automotive is and is there a threat of a double dip, at least from an automotive sector point? Um, well, there's obviously a lot of discussion about a double dip recession um, coming into 2012. Um, we, we actually believe that the industry, particularly automotive, will not see double dip recession in terms of production. Again, it's not going to jump back to 14 or 15. It's probably going to level out somewhere around 13 million units next year, which will be sort of a very steady growth and progression for companies. So we're hearing from companies that volumes are steady, but they're not necessarily flying through the roof, right? So where you're seeing companies grow and grow quickly, like in T1's case, is where you're taking on new business from some of the, the weaker companies that maybe didn't make it through the recession or new programs. Yeah. The, the most important thing about the industry today for an automotive supplier is that the, the market of the OEMs are no longer the, the Malibu of 500,000 units, right? We're gonna build a platform that's going to have 2 million units come off of it, but the complexity of those 2 million units will be lower volume, higher mix. So where I used to bid a part that would produce 500,000 units, now I'm going to bid five parts that's the same basic part but different for a model. Yeah. So it, it, it bodes well for a supplier, right? Because it means, obviously it means complexity, but it means more quote activity, more production to go around, which you know just gives more opportunity to the supply base. And we've seen that in that you, you have lower volumes, but then you also have parts that are sort of a global part. That's right. So you right. can have these lower volumes of 100,000 or maybe 75,000, but we also have parts now that are on a million. That's so right. So they're diversified across many of those platforms, right. and so they're a similar part. Right. I know you've talked about, and could you briefly talk about how the industry, which used to be a pretty stable 15 to 16 million in the decade of the 2000s, and you've talked a lot about being seeing more dramatic swings, maybe how it used to be in the past, and what's that going to mean for an automotive supplier? Right. Well, what, when you look at what's going on economically, and, and if you look out 10 to 15 years, what the effect is to the auto industry, and frankly any industry, is going to be um, a constancy of change. So where volumes might be 14 million this year in automotive, not this year, but maybe 2014, mm -hmm. yeah. in 2015 it might be 13 million. So you could see a flow or a swing of a million units or, or give or take 5% um, within, an, within any industry. Right. So in that really comes down to the unpredictability of our economy, our government, and, and just you know, the general supply and demand um, you know, makeup. The, the, the children coming in the world today are different than we were, their demands are different, they're looking for different things. Um, as we go to more of a green environment and electronification, you just see so many of those things coming together to create a different marketplace. So the impact to a supplier is, I as, a, as an owner of a company have to be able to flex my business 
and be able to manage it from an honest motive supplier like Team One. If this year it's 14 million and next year it's 13, and the year after it's 15, I've got to be able to go up and go down yeah. and make the same amount of money for to keep my banks happy, my employees employed, and the stakeholders um, in the business. So, so flexibility and what we mean by that invades every part of your business. Engineering has to flex up and down. I got to produce up and down. I have to basically manage my fixed overhead in, in a way that is at a lowest break even possible and be able to manage the rest of my business with variable overhead. So you almost need to set up for the lower end of the scale and being able to work up. up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Because then that way you can keep your employee base there That's right. and manage it through either temporary labor or overtime or unique shift patterns. You know, however that, that works. Or even many companies are looking at partnerships yeah. and relationships. Right. Maybe I can't flex to 15, but I have a partner who can, and it's a temporary situation. So collaboration will be big in the future. Right. So as you look to the future, what do you see as challenges or threats to, in particular, just the whole automotive industry? Well, obviously the biggest thing sitting in front of us is the next 12 months in the U.S. government, right? So um, it, it, the, the economy as a whole or the government as a whole is in a stalemate, right? Um, companies, this is why we can say we don't really see a double-dip recession coming, is that companies have money. People have money, right? The problem is we're all hoarding the money, we're holding on to it because we don't know what's coming. So we're sitting here in a situation where the government is in a stalemate because they're in what's called election stalemate, right? So nothing's going to happen and then we don't know who or what new policies will come in in 12 months that may change, particularly someone like yourself that's a small business owner. So, so right now the threat is if people continue to hoard cash in their bank account and pay down debt, that doesn't really spur the economy, right, right. which means we're not buying cars, which means you as suppliers don't see volume grow. Um, if companies continue to hoard cash, that means no capital investment, and again, that's the fallout to the supplier community. So I think the, the, the major push over the course of the next two to three quarters has to be the consumer considering to let go and, and begin to spend money again and that all comes down to confidence in our government, I guess, right? Yeah, and, and we can't control exactly. that. Exactly, really. that's so, right. So we have to be able to flex, that's as you right. mentioned. And sort of a final wrap-up question is, is we being an automotive supplier, within that automotive space, what do you see as opportunities or growth areas for businesses like Team One to, to go after and would be the highest success? Right. Well, I, I, you know, there's been a lot of change in the automotive industry, particularly as it relates to, to sales in terms of what you can and cannot do with your customer. And, and there's a lot of change going on within the vehicle itself to do what is called kind of design leadership, right? If you and I get into a vehicle, we sit in the car, what we look at is what makes us tend to buy the next car, right? Uh, and fortunately for you, a lot of what we look at in the vehicle tends to be plastic molded parts, right? right? So, so in, that, in the vein of that, you will see more complexity in the interior of the vehicle to make us want to run out and buy that next hmm. brand of vehicle. So, so I think in plastics particularly and in, in the look of the Class A surface parts, there will be a tremendous amount of new bidding opportunity. But my point about the sales piece is, you know, the, the days that we went through in the 80s and 90s where you couldn't take your purchasing manager out anymore and you couldn't build relationships, we kind of went the other extreme. Right. I actually think the return of the relationship is coming back. Now, I don't mean that we take them to golf and buy them fancy dinners, but I still believe that creating a relationship and selling the differentiation of your business, engineering capability, problem solving, and what you contribute as opposed to just shooting and shipping a part and delivering to them, is, is in the long run going to be a differentiator. Many of you would look at me and say, I don't believe it because it's not how you feel today. But I think going forward, that model has to change. It has to become more like a model we've seen of the best run OEMs. Right, right. Well, Lori, we appreciate that. And I would agree with you in terms of really the value, even at the Tier 2 and Tier 3 level, is, is how can you work with your customer to give them the resources and become the expert right. in it. And I'd like to say Lori and Harbor Results has really helped us over the last couple of years in terms of planning 
and really looking to the future so that we can be prepared um, for the growth that, that she talks about. So if you're interested in contacting Lori or we'd love your feedback, there'll be ways to do that on our website. So thank you and we'll be back soon.